Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's time to start our panel. I would like to greet you all, greet our panelists and the audience. And before we begin, I would like to thank the organizers, IDFI, uh, Bremen University, and uh, uh, the Federal Foreign Office for their a very thoughtful approach to start the forum on the prospects of Georgia's democratic and economic development with the panel which is dedicated to Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Uh, it's crystal clear that uh, promise to join NATO and uh, promise to integrate to the European Union has been the key driving force for Georgia's reforms domestically and key driving force for our economic transformation. At the same time, it is absolutely true that the, secure, the, that the peace, uh, stability and uh, prosperity highly depends on the security. Security, which is a commodity which cannot be taken for granted, of course. And this is a commodity which needs to be earned, sustained and proliferated across the Europe and the uh, Euro Atlantic. So today we will heavily focus on Georgia's uh, European and uh, Euro Atlantic perspectives with uh, a very distinguished panel what we have today and I will uh, very briefly introduce you uh, since you have uh, detailed bios of uh, every panelist. On my left, uh, Foreign Minister Mikhail Janelidze. Uh, Mikhail, prior to this position, served as the first Deputy Foreign Minister. And prior to that, for four years, he was the Deputy Minister for uh, the Economic and Sustainable Development Ministry. And it will be fair to say that he is the key negotiator from Georgia on the DCFTA issues and I would like to use this opportunity and thank him for all of his efforts, what he's done and what he's doing from his uh, new capacity. Uh, State Minister for European and Euro Atlantic Integration, David Bakradze. David is a career diplomat. Uh, his professional background includes a number of important diplomatic duties overseas. Mm, he served at the Embassy of Georgia to the Kingdom of Sweden and Finland at the same time as the permanent mission of Georgia to UN and other international organizations at Geneva. But before uh, joining this current position, uh, he served as the Georgia's ambassador to Greece, to Greece and the uh, Republic of Serbia. Uh, ambassador Bettina Kedenbach, uh, ambassador of uh, Federal Republic of Germany to Georgia, we're pleased to have you here. Ambassador is a career diplomat with a fascinating 20 years of experience. Uh, she served a number of key positions in the Foreign Ministry of Federal Republic of Germany and also she served uh, on a number of key posts uh, in different countries like the Embassy of Ankara, Tallinn, Tehran, as well as the permanent mission of Germany to the United Nations. Michael Emerson, Mr. Michael Emerson is well-known expert on EU foreign policy. His professional experience includes positions at the OECD in Paris, European Commission, and uh, in 1991 Mr. Remerson was appointed as the first EU ambassador to Russia. After returning from Russian Federation uh, in 1996, Mr. Remerson joined the London School of Economics, a senior research fellow, and then from 1998 to the present at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. And last but not least, my dear colleague, uh, uh, Ambassador Levan Dolidze, uh, fascinating expert in foreign policy and international relations. Levan served as Georgia's ambassador to NATO, and prior to that, he was the first deputy defense minister. So he, brings his, he will bring his experience to this panel today. And currently, Levan is the director of the Georgian Center for Security and uh, Development. Uh, it's crystal clear that Georgia's NATO and uh, EU integration, it's not only for benefit of Georgia, but it's also benefit for Europe and itself for the Euro-Atlantic area, because we have been trying so hard to 
move forward our strategic goal of making Europe whole, free and at peace. And uh, we witnessed progress over the, over the decades through the different waves of NATO and uh, EU enlargements. However, the developments in Georgia in 2008, Russian invasion and occupation of sovereign territory of our country and developments in Ukraine represent a dramatic peril to this progress. And uh, today, the Europe and Euro Atlantic area is less stable and more unpredictable. And as we speak, security of Europe and Euro Atlantic area is under the challenge. And regrettably, Europe today is not free, whole, and at peace. But before we start our discussion with Georgia's specific issues, I would like to turn to panelists for their views on the global trends and challenges affecting the European and Euro Atlantic security. How we're dealing against these challenges. How successful are our efforts and uh, how far we went with our grand strategic goal to make Europe free, whole and at peace. So I'll start with Foreign Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor uh, to be at this conference. I would like to thank uh, IDFI uh, for organizing this conference and George uh, for his very active uh, support of this uh, kind of uh, activities in Georgia and in general for his activities and uh, his organization's activities in Georgia which supports our development, uh, country's development, development of our institutions um, and um, freedom of uh, information. Uh, which is related with other uh, developments in the country. I, I want to thank uh, the ambassador of Germany and the embassy for supporting this event. And um, I'm sure that uh, this event will provide good opportunity to discuss very important issues, not only for Georgia, but uh, also for Europe, as it was mentioned uh, in the question, uh, in the first question to the panel. Uh, when we speak about uh, the uh, whole free uh, and at peace uh, Europe, uh, we have to first of all think about uh, what is today's Europe. And today's Europe uh, is a unity based on the shared values, uh, not only of the governments, but uh, of the European people. And uh, those values are related, we all know, uh, with the uh, human, its rights, and freedoms. Uh, the level of uh, the individual uh, uh, freedom, uh, level of the freedom of the individual defines the uh, level of the freedom of the society and of the state. Uh, and uh, we have to understand well uh, not only the uh, meaning of the word uh, freedom, but also understand what does it mean in practice. And uh, I, I think that uh, this public here um, doesn't need to uh, many explanations about what does it mean, uh, what uh, freedom means, but uh, I still want to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, we need to explain it uh, to uh, our people and try to uh, share with them uh, the understanding of the freedom of Europe, uh, which means that uh, every individual uh, to be free needs to be responsible and accountable for personal uh, life, and uh, that one's personal freedom ends at the point when it intersects with the freedom of the another person. And, uh, when every individual as well as government will understand that the only role of the state is to ensure protection of the principle of freedom, uh, then uh, the unity uh, will become stronger and uh, peace uh, will be ensured. How to achieve this in Europe? Europe should continue uh, exerting its efforts towards supporting transformation of European countries uh, like Georgia, into a place where the social and political freedoms are fully uh, protected. And uh, you should not, uh, the EU should not be afraid of the challenges on this path. Uh, I think by transforming 
and integrating us, uh, the EU will ensure safety and prosperity of the whole Europe. Georgia is a good uh, case in this regard, uh, and uh, we, uh, you know here well that we are progressing on all directions. It was well uh, mentioned by the ambassador uh, that uh, Georgia has tangible progress in every field of uh, uh, the uh, in every direction of our integration with the EU and the Atlantic space. We are the government of Georgia is highly committed uh, to continue uh, our uh, reform process which will ensure that all the freedoms are ensured in the country. That's, that makes countries stronger and more integrated with Europe. I think uh, uh, I'll not talk about the specific security and threats and uh, challenges now we have uh, in the region. We just need to be adhered to the principle of uh, supporting transformation of our nations, our countries, into a truly free and democratic countries, which will ensure then prosperity and uh, peace uh, in our region. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. State Minister, can you elaborate, please? Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me uh, join you in congratulating the organizers for this wonderful event. and. Uh, hope it will definitely contribute to the uh, process of Georgia's European and Euro Atlantic integration and this exchange of ideas with the civil society, which is the partner of the government on this very important path, on this very important uh, road, is, uh, uh, is very much appreciated. Uh, so, uh, the Europe uh, whole free and at peace, I think, is achievable. And uh, for that, uh, I'll just take one... Uh, lesson that comes from the uh, last century that uh, in that success in that was, was achieved in expanding uh, democracy, in expanding uh, uh, liberal market economy, uh, in, in strengthening the unity and uh, uh, in unity and uh, security. Uh, the world, the uh, Europe uh, whole free and at peace is, uh, may sound as a music to our ears, but it is not for uh, uh, some countries, for some uh, decision makers in, in Russia, for example, and uh, therefore the process that uh, we uh, face, the challenges that uh, come uh, against uh, that unity is uh, crystal clear, not only in Georgia or Eastern partner countries, but uh, in the Europe uh, as a whole. Therefore, I think uh, our approach should be strategic, it should be uh, united. Mm, and uh, I think that uh, despite that uh, this approach is uh, wide, we uh, see the differences, how it differs from country to country, from region to region. And I think we'll have the opportunity to discuss this as a challenge when we will uh, talk about the European and Euro Atlantic uh, uh, path and challenges on the road for Georgia. Thank you. Ambassador, please, could you share your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a very starting to be a very interesting discussion, so thank you once again for those who gave us the opportunity to share some of our views here. If we look at Europe, we, on the one hand, of course, we look at the whole of Europe. We look at all those countries who are not members of the European Union yet, and we look at their aspirations, and we look at the support that we can possibly give them. As I said uh, in my introductory remarks, that we have all the tools there to work with them to get even more closer. But on the other hand, I'm also looking at from inside the European Union, and there, what do I see? I see a European Union that is challenged right now. We are having to face a very, very heavy migration crisis. We are having our core values challenged. We have to find answers to what does the European Union provide, what does it stand for, which are actually the values that we embrace when we deal with this migration crisis, and how do we allocate the resources needed. We are looking at security challenges, 
coming from different threats all around Europe, from the north, from the south, and we look at how do we address these challenges within the European U Union and how at the same time do we bring those who want to come closer to us, how do we bring them closer and eventually integrate them. That is the, the dual challenge that we have to face. We have to do this in the European Union and we also do this within NATO because the challenges are somewhat different but overall they remain the same. So it is not just about getting countries closer, it is also to how do we organize ourselves, what do we stand for, how do we manage this crisis, because we of course want to be attractive as a partner, we want to be attractive as a union, but we also, that means we need to know who we are and what we stand for. So that is one of the biggest challenges that we have to face right now and for which we have to find the answers, and that is not going to be easy, it is a very harsh and painful process. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Emerson. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, delighted to be here again. Uh, to Tbilisi, more beautiful than ever. Um, I've been coming here for 15 years. So I've been watching this happening. Um, uh, just a word on my standpoint in all of this. Uh, I'm currently engaged uh, on a project looking closely into the three association agreements, um, DCFTA, with Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, all in parallel. <coughs> Each of them in partnership with um, uh, experts from the countries concerned. And in this particular case, uh, our principal partner, I'm very glad to say, is somebody most people here will know rather well, Tamara Kobzaridzi, who is uh, in somewhere in the audience there. So uh, the question is what theme to um, highlight. Uh, I mean, I agree with everything that the three preceding speakers uh, have said, so I'll differentiate myself a little bit uh, and say that in thinking about all of this, uh, uh, let us look, in the case of Georgia, for the potential synergies that are around in order to create uh, now uh, a new uh, economic dynamic in, in particular uh, for the brand Georgia. The uh, Ambassador Herman, my old friend who was there, spoke about uh, benefits from the DCFTA coming over time, uh, to which I would say yes, and there's no time like the present. <coughs> um, and what I mean by that is if you look at where Georgia is positioned now uh, from the standpoint of potentially creating some important new economic and social dynamic, then it's a very interesting picture indeed. Um, and the items that I put in this, uh, well, the DCFTA speaks for itself, but there's a new visa uh, uh, element that is now, I think, an irreversible uh, commitment. <clears throat> Number two, the Ukraine factor. Um, now, uh, that's uh, over the other side of the Black Sea, but what is extremely important for the DCFTA process is that the Ukrainian DCFTA now is in action and <clears throat> the Russian endeavors to basically derail it have failed. And so all three DCFTAs, and the D Ukraine, the biggest one of all, is in action. And then what did Ukraine do when Russia said, we will still punish you uh, by forbidding um, transit from Ukraine through to Kazakhstan for important quantities of goods? Um, uh, Ukraine said to Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan, let us develop the transit route across the Black Sea through the Caucasus and across to Caspian. So that's one point. Now, Kazakhstan, we're into Kazakhstan. There's a new EU uh, Enhanced Partnership and Cooperation Agreement with Kazakhstan, uh, which is politically signaling uh, that the business is open for looking for uh, further development of the Kazakh relationship. And as soon as you start looking at that, you're looking at uh, transport corridors and links between the EU and Kazakhstan uh, through the South Caucasus. Um, now, the China factor. Now, this, I think, is going to be very interesting indeed. I understand that the, China, the Georgian government is now embarking upon a free trade 
uh, agreement negotiation with China. I think this is an excellent idea, and it goes so well alongside um, the, the DCFTA, uh, when also combined with the Chinese huge ambitions for the new Silk Road, part of which would go through, again, uh, Central Asia, Caspian, Caucasus, uh, on in, into Europe. Now, there's a very interesting point here, that the, if China starts looking at uh, Georgia as a useful base for manufacturing things to export to the European Union, the European Union will certainly be very attentive to, technically, the rules of origin. Will 40% of the value added be made here, which is a prerequisite for that to work? Well, the interesting point here is that you, Georgia, you already have your free trade agreement with, uh, with Turkey, which is part of the customs union. So any value added uh, that in your supply chain uh, that includes Turkish elements all goes into the 40% required for free trade with the European Union. So uh, there's a very interesting thing there. Another new point, or new Turkey point, is that since last year, Turkey is now electricity. Turkey is now fully synchronized with the European grid. And we know that you know, Georgia has huge potential in the hydroelectric domain. And then this, and then you can make a, a, the Iran, the new Iran point if I want to. I pass rapidly over that just to finish on the Russia point. Of course, this is a big black spot because Russia economically is in uh, recession. And um, the customs union, uh, the Eurasian customs union, is there as their flagship project, which they see as competition or the alternative to the DCFTA. Well, the big point to be made there is that the Eurasian Customs Union is looking pretty sick. Uh, it is not functioning. Um, uh, poor Armenia and Kazakhstan, dragged into this, are now having to raise their customs duties by comparison with their WTO-bound levels. Uh, which is creating all sorts of problems. And there's no solidarity in that customs union because the sanctions that Russia has applied towards Ukraine, uh, European Union, and now Turkey, are not followed by Kazakhstan uh, uh, and Armenia. So, Georgia, you're well out of that one, uh, I think is the conclusion. So, my overall conclusion is you've got multiple components here for building up some new... Uh, synergy and, and, and positive uh, dynamics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Emerson. Of course, all the elements you brought are very important for the uh, grand strategy of Europol Free and at Peace. And of course, we will discuss uh, at length in the course of our panel today. Uh, Ambassador Dolizzi, could you please uh, give us a review about where we stand with regard to Europol Free and at Peace and what needs to be done to further promote this strategic goal? Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me also express the gratitude to IDFI and the German federal government and the Bremen University for convening such an, we can already say, such an interesting uh, and uh, timely uh, conference. As uh, for the question, uh, first of all, of course, uh, if we analyze the current development and threat posed by state as well as non-state ac actors across the whole Euro-Atlantic area, we will very easily draw the conclusion that, unfortunately, the strategic uh, vision and strategic goal, Europe whole, free and at peace, is unfortunately not accomplished uh, so far. Especially bearing in mind the efforts of Russia to reassert the spheres of privileged interest in the region by occupation and annexation of uh, uh, the territories of neighboring uh, states. Uh, the reasons are many and different. Some of them were already covered by previous panelists, but with your permission I will I would uh, focus on uh, number, some of them and first of all let me uh, start with the uh, with the issue which is absolutely in compliance uh, with the title of our panel, namely Georgia's European and Euro Atlantic aspirations. And here I would say that it is not about uh, the future of Georgia. It is about the idea Europe all free and at peace. It is about uh, the commitment to the fundamental principles of the Western institutions, including the principle of open door policy, 
And of course, it is about the commitments to the decisions which were taken by the allies, uh, allies and their uh, effective implementations. Uh, of course, in addition to it, also we all agree that the Cold War really belongs to the history, but very unfortunately, we can also say that the issue of deterrence still remains uh, relevant. Uh, and the, yesterday's development uh, due to violation of Turkey's airspace is a vivid demonstration of it. Uh, therefore, uh, with the aim to reinforce the mechanisms of the deterrence across the Euro-Atlantic community, I think that it is critically important to achieve sustainable unity within the euro uh, across the main pillars of European security. And of course, it is also very important to further improve the uh, transatlantic ties. And one more point, which is also directly related to uh, reinforcing the deterrence mechanism is implementation, effective implementation of the readiness action uh, plan and uh, commitments to the decisions which envisage uh, the increased spending on the defense including on improving defense capabilities. Of course, it's needless to say how important it is defining a comprehensive strategy toward the neighborhood and uh, implementing effective uh, security policy strategy toward the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I cannot agree with you more on, uh, on your statements. And uh, to put it in a nutshell, security and deterrence is absolutely essential to ensure sustainable economic development, as well as democratic uh, developments. Uh, last year, uh, we've seen uh, movements towards uh, the strategic goal, Europol free and peace. And uh, by saying that, I mean the NATO's December 40 ministerial decision to invite Montenegro to the alliance. This is a very positive step for Georgia. And this is a very positive step for the alliance, and this is very positive for European and uh, Euro-Atlantic security. And down the road we have a NATO summit in uh, Warsaw. We also had very positive developments on the EU front. Association agreement got ratified by all member states, and uh, we got very positive reports which will pave the way for the visa-free regime for Georgian citizens to the Schengen area. So uh, I'll start these personal questions to uh, the foreign minister and the state minister to give us an overview where we stand regarding Georgia's NATO membership prospects and regarding EU uh, integration process. And what are our key milestones down the road? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so membership in uh, European and Euro-Atlantic institutions is uh, considered uh, as a return uh, to the European family of nations where Georgia belongs historically and mentally. And I uh, talked about this uh, in my first comment. It's a fair choice of our people and uh, uh, a matter of broad consensus also among uh, the major political forces. And uh, the EU and NATO integration uh, it's not the uh, same process, but these are two parallel processes, uh, both of which involve a multitude of reforms and uh, modernization of the country. And not only the final goal, which is the membership, full membership uh, in the both organizations, uh, but uh, the process itself is very important. Uh, the signature of the historic agreement, uh, association agreement, uh, including the deep and comprehensive free trade theory agreement, uh, was uh, 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 provided a new opportunity for us to move our relations with the EU to a qualitatively new level and uh, to launch an ambitious agenda of political association and economic integration. We have already, we are already finalizing three-year uh, association agenda, which was agreed between Georgia and the EU, and we want to agree on a new agenda, which will be more ambitious and provide an opportunity for more integration with the EU structures. 
We uh, firmly believe that the association agreement is not the final stage uh, in our progressive relations and uh, there is more we can strive for to achieve our goal of building a truly European democracy. Uh, I think uh, when we are talking about uh, the uh, NATO, also a NATO integration, uh, first of all, we uh, want, I want to share with you that, you know, and which is not a secret, that we uh, see, uh, consider NATO as the only collective security organization that is capable to provide security to its uh, member states and strength and stability in the uh, Euro-Atlantic area. Uh, and, um, at the same time, I want to mention that uh, NATO is not only uh, organization only oriented on uh, security. Uh, it's uh, it is an organization which uh, has members united uh, with uh, the shared values, and uh, it uh, it is based on freedom, democracy, and respect of human rights. That's why. Our relation with NATO also uh, covers the reform agenda of uh, Georgia. We are uh, in uh, uh, relations uh, with NATO since uh, 1992, uh, but uh, uh, it has become uh, stronger and stronger since uh, 2004. First, we went, uh, we uh, got an individual partnership action plan. Then, in uh, 2008, uh, we got uh, the. Uh, annual national program and uh, since then the short and uh, long term strategy of Georgia's development including military reforms foreign and security policy administration, good governance uh, building democracy and economic uh, development is coordinated uh, with the alliance and is in compliance with the uh, recommendations uh, coming from the alliance and the uh, member states uh, as a result of this process, we can be confident that the fundamental reforms uh, that you conduct uh, are in line with the highest standards and uh, bring us uh, to our ultimate uh, objective of NATO membership. At present, uh, the uh, Georgia's relations with the, uh, uh, with the alliance are solid and dynamic. Uh, we are implementing uh, dynamically the substantial NATO Georgia package, which was adopted in uh, 2014, and uh, our, it's uh, our primary aim uh, to strengthen Georgia's uh, defense capabilities, uh, which will help us uh, uh, in our preparation towards membership. And I have to recall here the last uh, foreign ministers uh, meeting uh, in December, NATO foreign ministers meeting. Uh, which again uh, proved that uh, NATO doors uh, are open, which was a very important message for, uh, to, for us. And at the same time, about Georgia, it has clearly stated that Georgia has all instruments necessary for eventual membership. Uh, we need to use those uh, instruments effectively on our uh, side and uh, uh, to, uh, to make, uh, we want to make sure that uh, once there is a uh, door of opportunity, we, we will use that uh, chance. And uh, I think that uh, we have to uh, also have right communication with uh, our society, uh, with our people, and uh, explain all the benefits which are provided not only Again, I will reiterate, not only uh, by the final goal of uh, being a member of the organization, but of the, uh, by the process itself. Uh, and uh, this is exactly uh, the process which uh, brings us, uh, you know, brings to Georgia uh, stability, um, prosperity, and uh, development. We, uh, I think, Georgia. Uh, is a, uh, a role model in our region uh, in implementing uh, fundamental institutional reforms and uh, in transforming itself into a truly democratic uh, country and uh, we need uh, to keep this progress and uh, continue uh, moving firmly on this path. 
Uh, on the uh, European prospects, as I mentioned, you know, we will continue very uh, active implementation of all related reforms to strengthen our institutions and to be more integrated with the European structures. This is the goal uh, of our government for today and uh, our goal is also to communicate this uh, uh, in a proper main, um, uh, way uh, with our uh, population. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I will concentrate on the uh, challenges that we have on that path, especially uh, internally. First, uh, let me start that uh, the European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations were the main driving force uh, for the transformation, for the reforms that uh, Georgia undergone, that once uh, might have been considered unthinkable. And we are in the uh, situation, position where Mm, our aspirations are uh, related with the more uh, tangible results uh, when it comes to the prospects of the membership. Uh, mm, uh, well, the process of the reforms itself is, uh, of course, very important, and, uh, uh, but also this is the process that is uh, in many ways um, very sensitive in uh, sometimes very expensive and uh, maybe sometimes even painful but I think that uh, what what we want uh, to show and, uh, is that uh, I represent the government that uh, is determined uh, to continue responsibly uh, the, the reforms that we have uh, undertaken with our European and Euro Atlantic aspirations. And I think what makes uh, also uh, the other stakeholders responsible is uh, especially the eve of the elections uh, to, to uh, not to be tempted to uh, capitalize on the uh, unpopular but important reforms that we have to undergo. Um, in that sense, I think uh, consolidating uh, the efforts of the uh, all pro-Western political parties uh, of the civil society and the government uh, is very important. Um, well, I hope that when we talk about the Warsaw Summit, uh, what we uh, hope for is uh, to get politically closer and to have uh, at hand even more tools to prepare ourselves for the uh, membership uh, and as it was uh, at the practical level declared in, in uh, December Minister that Georgia has all necessary tools at hand, uh, all necessary practical tools to prepare for membership and uh, in that sense political decision uh, is what will uh, what will uh, uh, what is, uh, on the one hand, a very well-deserved decision and what is to be taken by the 28 and after some 29 members of the, uh, of the organization. Um, what we also uh, have as a very important challenge for the, uh, important, I mean, very significant challenge for Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations is uh, also, uh, the uh, anti-Western uh, uh, propaganda and uh, the efforts, uh, uh, and to be very open, the hybrid war that we are together uh, with the European Union uh, in uh, protecting uh, the democratic uh, values uh, and in protecting uh, uh, European idea. Uh, well, I will not go into the history. We know that uh, Georgia, as well as Ukraine, have undergone uh, very intensive uh, inter military intervention to start with, and, and uh, economic pressure or other forms of uh, other forms of hybrid warfare. Uh, but this is the people that has made uh, their choice to uh, come back to their historic home, which is also a 
geopolitical ambition for our government and that is uh, what uh, we uh, with our reforms uh, are uh, realizing um, and on that uh, path, I think uh, uh, that uh, in strategic communication with our public, which is one important, uh, let's say, uh, issue that our office is dealing with, is uh, uh, is to change uh, from uh, the support towards uh, EU and NATO integration from from emotional to the knowledge based. Uh, the support that can not be uh, challenged in the future. Uh, and of course, uh, we all understand that postponement on uh, specific decisions, be it visa liberalization or postponement in, in uh, uh, extending the European perspective uh, for Georgia uh, is, uh, will not be helping at this road. And uh, with the reforms that we undergo with the full support of the uh, European Union and its member state, I think uh, this is uh, the road that we uh, will need to uh, uh, we will need to walk uh, together. Uh, I think uh, at this uh, point uh, I'll stop and I'll be happy to continue the discussion. Thank you, Thank you ministers, for your thoughtful comments. It's crystal clear that uh, we have uh, many important milestones down the road, especially from now to the NATO summit in uh, Poland. And uh, along with the milestones, we have uh, many challenges. And the first and foremost challenge what we have is uh, security related. And of course, Georgia will not be able to address all these challenges solely and alone. And that's why we need robust cooperation with our uh, friends and international partners. And Germany has been playing a vital role for Georgia's statehood and of course it has an exceptional role in Georgia's NATO membership process as well. Uh, Ambassador, well, we would like to hear your views about uh, the priorities of the Federal Republic of Germany in relations with Georgia, having in mind the upcoming NATO summit in uh, Poland, Warsaw. Thank you. Um, before I start, let me say that Germany doesn't have any more vital role to play than any other NATO member because whatever we decide, it's on consensus. That means every NATO member has the same vote, the same say, and the same possibility to bring their own ideas to the table. So it's not that our role is somewhat exceptional or anything like that. Just having said that, well, what we see when we look at NATO. I talked about, um, I briefly mentioned that we face a lot of challenges when it comes to the European Union internally. When I look at NATO right now, what we see is a security environment, a strategic environment that has changed dramatically over the past years. What we see is that NATO has to adapt its strategy and its priorities because the international order seems to be eroding. What NATO has to face is the Ukrainian-Russia conflict and for this we have to find a way how to deal with Russia once again, where NATO thought this problem has been solved. Now it hasn't. We look at the frozen conflict, which is Georgia, Transnistria, Nagorno-Karabakh. We also look at the north of Africa. We look at the Middle East conflict, at Syria, at Iraq. The tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia are not really good. We look at the threat that's coming from ISIS. And then there are the Euro-Atlantic security threats coming from NATO's wider neighborhood, which is Mali, which is the Horn of Africa, which is Yemen. Afghanistan still has its unresolved problems. And if that weren't enough, we are having also these other transnational threats like cybersecurity, hybrid warfare, and international terrorism. The attacks in Istanbul and Paris have highlighted once again that terrorism threatens us all. And NATO is affected by all of that. And this also means that every country that is attached to NATO, that wants to be integrated, that is working on its path, is somehow involved in this, is threatened by this, and has to find answers. So the whole security architecture that we are working on right now is something that NATO is looking at. 
once again, nature has to deal with questions that we believed were overcome, which is deterrence, which is a big issue right now. It is collective defense that is right now. The, the way summit really was the turning point when it came to adjust NATO's policies to return to collective defense as a core mission. And this summit then also um, renewed the readiness to bring Georgia even closer to the alliance. That is why we agreed on the, this substantial package. And when it comes to priorities, this package, which is fairly new, a very new instrument, that now has to be implemented. It's been five months, more or less, that everything has been set on its path. After five months, there is no evaluation that the work is done. Quite on the contrary, we have seen how we have to start, how we have to continue this, how we have, how we can we make it sustainable. We, that is the NATO members, together with Georgia, how can we make this sustainable? How can it be underpinned with the necessary human and financial resources? that are needed for all of this. And Germany is going to support, to fully support Georgia in this whole process, and this is our priority, and I think this is our shared priority. See, we completely appreciate, and fully appreciate, what Georgia is doing when um, Georgia is participating in NATO operations, when it is participating in operations and missions of the European Union. This is done just not only to bring Georgia closer to NATO and to the European Union and to increase interoperability. We believe this is also done because we share the same assessment of what are the threats that we need to answer to, that we share the same assessment that these crises are crises that have to be solved and that we have to do it jointly. And this is ultimately what matters, that we have the same view and the same outlook on the challenges that are all around us. And from this, everything else then um, will continue. And this is, I think, what we have to focus on. There is one point which I like to challenge a little bit, what, um, what Michael said, and that is that NATO is the only organization to providing European security. Well, there is the European Union, there is the defense dimension of the European Union. Georgia is participating in the missions. Georgia has been heavily involved in the mission in Mali and also in the mission in uh, the Central African Republic. So also the European Union is addressing these questions. And also um, what we see is that when the latest attacks happened in Paris, what happened was that France <coughs> turned to the European Union and asked for the support and it didn't turn to NATO at that point and ask for NATO to get involved in that. So there are two organizations now. One is, I understand that it's much more developed when it comes to dealing with military threats, but the European Union is also setting itself up. And one of the things that is certainly going to happen and one of the, the major themes that will certainly come up at the Warsaw Summit is how do the European Union and NATO work together when it comes to addressing threats and challenges. Thank you, Ambassador, and that's why we are aspiring to join both organizations, NATO and the European Union as well. Uh, you mentioned Georgia's contribution to the uh, global peace and security, and I would like to use this opportunity and once again praise and thank our militaries, men and women in uniform, for their deeds and contributions to what they've been doing for, for all these years. Our militaries brought Georgia in the other screen of our international arena. That's why I'm, I'm really grateful to serve for 15 months as Deputy Defense Minister and I've never missed the chance to praise all of them for their deeds and contributions. So, uh, Mr. Emerson, uh, well, Ambassador just uh, outlined a number of challenges that the uh, European Union faces and Europe and Euro-Atlantic community faces. Uh, and uh, this very issue was extensively discussed in Davos a couple of weeks ago. Uh, are these challenges strengthen European Union or there is a kind of a threat that we will see the defragmented European Union down the road? Yeah, I've been in European Union affairs for almost half a century, uh, hence quite a lot of grey hairs up here. I've been through quite a few 
crises that were uh, considered existential uh, at the time, uh, which were uh, resolved effectively. Our question now is there are multiple crises I mean, the security crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the refugee crisis, and the Brexit uh, crisis. Now, uh, all of these things are there together. So, this is looking rather like a perfect storm. And so, it's uh, certainly a really tough challenge for our political leaders to keep these processes manageable. And what is certain is that all of these challenges are going to require important inflections of policy, policy initiatives, which up until yesterday uh, were considered impossible, but now become necessary. Um, and you see this uh, even vividly um, every week in the political uh, debate within in Germany, uh, for a start, but not only in Germany, in France, the UK, elsewhere. So um, we don't know what the resolution of these issues is going to be. Uh, however, um, the core values of the European Union are very deeply entrenched at the level of our societies and the political challenges, I mean one can mention also uh, uh, the political challenges from the extreme right and the extreme left which are more present now than at any other time uh, in the post-war period, uh, these political challenges have to be, have to be faced. Uh, Everybody is engaged in these struggles, one way or another, um, and uh, we, uh, we have to see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but uh, I, I would say that the structures, and indeed the institutional structures, both on the security side, both NATO and the European Union, are very robust. Thank, thank you, Mr. Emerson. Uh, despite some uh, different opinions within the organization, uh, actually, uh, I and most of my colleagues were really pleased to see the December decision of the European Union to prolong for six more months the sanctions against the Russian Federation. This was a clear demonstration of the unity within the European Union, and I hope that this policy will be continued uh, until Ukraine is free and until Georgia is free from Russian military forces. I would like to go back to NATO-related issue and uh, bring into discussion uh, Ambassador Dolide um, in the lead-up of uh, NATO Warsaw Summit. Uh, what will be your advice to the government? Since now you act from the civil society um, organization front, what will be your advice to the government? What steps needs to be taken to ensure the maximum positive result from the summit and also what civil society should do to support the government in that front because I, here I see a lot of civil society representatives and my personal belief is that uh, you need to be invited and you need to uh, move forward in support of the government as well when it comes to the fundamental issues like Georgia's NATO membership process. Thank you. <coughs> I would combine these two issues, the role of civil society and the government and First of all, I would reflect on the need of uh, consolidation around the main uh, security policy challenges the country is facing today and will be facing in upcoming years as well. Because uh, sometimes I have the impression that in, fra in front of very well organized hybrid warfare machine on the part of Russian Federation, which of course aims to derail Georgia from its Euro-Atlantic integration path, not only government, but in general, the political spectrum of the country sometimes is absolutely disorganized. 25 years of independence, I think, has provided more than enough lessons to draw appropriate conclusions and uh, to act accordingly. Uh, therefore, I, of course, uh, don't have the illusion that all major political parties who share the same vision when it comes to foreign and security policy priorities will act according to the same agenda, of course. We should not, uh, I think that it will be even counterproductive for Georgia's democracy. However, I think that the issues such as development of the occupation line, Georgia's NATO membership process, in general, European and Euro Atlantic integration process, should be the part of very active and effective coordination among uh, those political forces 
uh, and of course at least some red line should be defined, defined which will not be crossed by anybody. It is worthless to mention how important it is to improve coordination among different branches of the government and luckily we can already say that uh, some positive uh, signs are already quite uh, noticeable which we should appreciate. As uh, for other part, of course it is also very important the issue of uh, strategic communication. And uh, first let me say that the State Minister's Office and specifically the Center of NATO and EU is doing a very good job with the aim to raise the public awareness in different regions of Georgia. And we also understand the importance of managing expectations within the country in parallel of very effective uh, efforts on the international arena. But uh, uh, I really appreciate how the uh, Ambassador Gandenbach enlisted the number of achievements that we really have. And therefore, I agree with the position that uh, while talking on NATO and EU context, we should not be focused only on the possible prospect we can achieve in the future. I think that more emphasis should be made domestically with the aim to achieve the goals of strategic communication here in Georgia on the successes and on the practical benefits which we already get from as a result of cooperation with you and uh, NATO. Therefore, I think that apart from benefits which we get from DCFTA and uh, visa-free uh, so post decisions which will be, will be taken uh, on visa-free, we should explain more in public discussion to the society how important are different elements of the NATO Georgia substantial package. How important is that defense capacity building mission already operates in the defense ministry and the joint staff? How important is for the security uh, of Georgia, the NATO Georgia Training and Evaluation Center? How important is that Georgia is named without any ambiguity as an aspirant country? And how important is that an alliance and knowledge the high level interoperability of Georgia military, uh, military forces? And Georgia, uh, Elias also quite clearly underlined that Georgia has all practical tools uh, to be prepared for uh, NATO members. Therefore, I think that we should be all vocal in public discussion on those uh, issues. Uh, from the strategic point of view, I agree also the position, with the position of Ambassador Ganderbach about the many challenges that we are facing across the whole Euro Atlantic area. It's really very hard to remember any time in the history of the world when we face so many challenges and threats all together. Uh, and it's a long time that uh, Georgia has been acting according to the principles of strategic patience. But I think that with the aim to achieve strategic objectives, I think it's very important to take strategic decisions and to take decisive steps with the aim to achieve the above mentioned goals, including the goal Europe whole free and at peace. Therefore, I don't think that keeping Georgia hanging limbo is a solution for ensuring security in the region. Moreover, I think that if we don't take uh, decisive steps related to Georgia's membership, uh, if we create the perception that unless Russia can create uh, uh, conflict in different uh, parts of the region and that matters for the enlargement policy, etc., we should expect that this kind of problems will be created in Russia by Russia in the future as well. That, that's why I think that we understand the importance of strategic patience. We have been acting according to this patience. It's a long time, but I also believe that it's time to take uh, decisive uh, steps in these directions. When it comes how we should define our position uh, for the Warsaw Summit, uh, taking into account the above mentioned, I think that we can be uh, very ambitious uh, by the next summit. Uh, and uh, we should not be focused on the procedures and labels. We should be focused on the decisions related to Georgia's uh, membership, but also, of course, we need to bear in mind the current geopolitical re uh, realities, and in addition to it, we need to see the concrete deliverables which will strengthen Georgia's defense capabilities and which will improve security environment in Georgia. And last but not least, what should be done by Georgia uh, itself uh, and what we should achieve domestically. With the understanding that decisions on Georgia's membership will be taken based on the strategic interests of their allies and based on the will of Georgian people, of course, uh, we should be very careful not to give any pretext to our friends, first of all, and our allies uh, in NATO or elsewhere, 
to put under the question the process of maturing democracy and the pluralism within the country. Moreover, we should be very active, we should be proactive with the aim to create different, uh, to create more European elements in different areas that will definitely positively imply on the country profile and I believe that when the window of opportunity opens, that will play its positive role. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Levan, for your input to this discussion. It's very useful. And uh, as I mentioned, the role of the civil society organizations, the openness of the government, and very sophisticated approach to the policies and reforms are essential to guarantee the maximum possible result at the NATO summit in Warsaw. We have less than 30 minutes, and I want to open the floor for the questions. And uh, I see uh, the first hand here, the gen gentleman. And the second hand here. My name is Andrei Alarionov. I'm a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington. I have a couple of questions for the uh, respective ministers and one uh, question for the Mrs. Ambassador. Uh, for uh, uh, ministers, the first question concerning this recent uh, idea that has been promoted by the government about Gazprom participation in the gas market in Georgia. Could you please provide your assessment what role this idea plays in Euro-Atlantic integration of Georgia and Euro-Atlantic exploration of Georgia. Second question concerning um, the issue that has been touched several times by a number of uh, presenters. Uh, eight years ago, Georgia had become uh, a victim of Russian aggression and the country that helped enormously at that time, both and always politically, diplomatically, military was Ukraine. Uh, two years ago, Ukraine became a victim of Russian aggression. Why Georgian government did not help Ukraine, at least on the same level, uh, politically, diplomatically, on the other ways to Ukraine, when Ukraine became a victim? My question to Mrs. Ambassador. Uh, also, eight years ago, during the Bucharest summit of NATO, uh, uh, Germany did play a crucial role not allowing uh, Georgia and Ukraine having mark uh, program on a pass to NATO. Now we all know that this decision actually allowed Russia attack Georgia first, Ukraine second. Thus, German government understands that this particular decision did uh, pave a way for Russian aggression. And do you understand the, your contribution to the fact that happened in Georgia and Ukraine all since then? And why don't you think to correct these decisions to invite Georgia and Ukraine to mark at Warsaw Summit this summer? Thank you. Minister, would you react on that? Last part of the question, could you, could you repeat? Uh, uh, to the minister. To, to the, the ambassador. To the ambassador, okay. Uh, the first one is the responsibility of George, Germany for allowing, permitting, or maybe even inviting uh, Russian troops to Georgia in Ukraine. And second, what would be the best way to correct those mistakes that have been committed by the German government? by uh, inviting Georgia and Ukraine now to at least mark program this summer in Warsaw. In Warsaw. My membership action plan, so membership, how to correct this uh, mistake to invite Georgia and Ukraine to join membership action plan. So, yes, State Minister, please. Thank you for the questions. Uh, first of all, let me... Uh, uh, let me uh, go back to, to uh, one one issue that that uh, uh, the ambassador has, has uh, mentioned that uh, Georgian soldiers are not there to to uh, to prove something other than uh, Georgia's aspirations. Of course, uh, no one would would uh, uh, describe uh, participation other than commitment by country, by its citizens, to the shared values that uh, we protect. Uh, 
but this is just uh, one uh, part of a demonstration that country is uh, able and willing uh, to uh, contribute to the international operations. And that is one important precondition in that. In addition to uh, the uh, instruments that Georgia has, uh, like annual national programs, which no any other uh, other uh, country has uh, without the membership action plan, and we have had seven successful years, and we are entering the eighth very ambitious year of democratic reforms. Uh, having the NATO Georgia uh, Commission that no other aspirant country other than Georgia has being enhanced opportunity partner that you have already mentioned. So these are the instruments uh, that, that prepare Georgia for the membership. Uh, to the questions, uh, first of all, the uh, Ukraine. Uh, let me be very clear that uh, Georgia uh, shares uh, the aspirations, uh, the same, same aspirations, and unfortunately we have similar challenges with Ukraine. And in that uh, fight, and in that uh, strategic communication, and in that policy making, we are together. I have uh, no problem in uh, coordinating our uh, European and, uh, aspiration and European integration policies with my colleagues. And uh, when it comes to the country, I think uh, Georgia, from the very first days, were the one of the leader countries in supporting from humanitarian uh, point of view uh, Ukraine. And in our uh, uh, communication with our partners, the aspirations that Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova has are always come together when it comes to the political or diplomatic work that we do. And about the gas from, I don't uh, see any, if I may quote, idea behind it. Uh, it's an uh, issue that has been described by the respective uh, colleague of mine, Minister of Energy, as a process that Georgia has been throughout the years, and there is no shift that one can describe as an idea. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I'll just briefly add to what uh, my colleagues said. That uh, first question was with, uh, with regards to Gazpro. I think again we see the uh, um, this question uh, being raised, uh, and uh, we need to, uh, I think again, provide uh, more information to the society. What does it mean? So, first of all. Uh, politicizing this issue and linking it especially with the European and Euro Atlantic integration parts of Georgia is not uh, correct and I will explain why. Uh, gas gas uh, to Georgia is provided by our strategic partner Azerbaijan and uh, we are very happy with these relations and we, uh, we uh, consider these relations as strategic. We are grateful to Azerbaijan for the support which uh, it has provided during the years and there is no any uh, threat uh, to our strategic partnership and cooperation with Azerbaijan on that issue. Uh, question related with Gazprom and the negotiations with Gazprom, first of all we have to understand that uh, those negotiations have, are happening every year we are uh, having contractual relations with Gazprom. Georgia has contractual relations with Gazprom already for more than 10 years. Uh, annually, we have uh, uh, needs uh, for gas supplies uh, due to the increased uh, consumption. Unfortunately, during this year and pre previous years, we saw that uh, uh, there is a much uh, higher consumption than technically Azerbaijan can deliver through their uh, uh, pipeline and uh, facilities, although they have enough gas, but uh, there are some problems related with uh, uh, the uh, supply of uh, that resources. That's why we needed to uh, enter into these negotiations with Gazprom about the 
uh, additional capacities which are needed in the season period. Uh, and I think these explanations have been given uh, by the relevant uh, ministry, sectoral ministry, dealing with those issues. And it, it is uh, technical issues which cannot be related to politics as well as to our uh, European and Euro-Atlantic investigation path. Although we uh, quite clearly understand that uh, every type of relations needs to be also evaluated according to the uh, possible threats and uh, when we take uh, steps uh, one or another the government evaluates those steps from all points of view and uh, uh, evaluates risks related uh, to each step the major our path is a European and Euro-Atlantic integration path and there will be no step made by the government of Georgia which will hinder uh, our progress uh, in this direction. With regards to Ukraine, as a foreign minister, I want to confirm once again, it doesn't require a reiteration of it, but I want here, as it was raised, I want to again confirm that we are fully uh, supportive and committed to continue assisting Ukraine in uh, overcoming all their challenges and uh, uh, we don't see any area where Ukraine uh, was asking for the support or needed support and Georgia has not provided that assistance and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So what we heard from the Foreign Minister and the State Minister is uh, really reassuring about uh, our commitments towards European and Euro-Atlantic integration. However, I would uh, stress the huge need and importance of improving the strategic communications because this issue has been purely, in my opinion, was created because of the lack of strategic communication at the earliest stage. So uh, I know that uh, you've been working uh, with uh, multiple governments to improve the strategic communication capabilities. And the first country that comes to my mind is uh, United Kingdom, uh, Prime Minister has the UK's advisor and the NATO core team has a um, uh, strategic communication advisor in the team. So I hope this communication will be improved between the government and society and the government will become even more transparent which will serve for the greater good. Ambassador, I guess it's your turn. Thank you. It seems really that communication is a big issue here because um, I am somewhat surprised by this harsh assessment of the German role. Um, I must say, as a German citizen, I find it very interesting to hear that we have the power, apparently, to, sh to change unilaterally the whole fate of nations. As a German diplomat, I have to say this is not so. We don't act unilaterally. We act in accordance with our partners in the European Union, in NATO, in other fora that we have, in other organizations that we have. I do not see that Germany played a sinister role in allowing Russia to invade Georgia and then paving the way for doing the same in Ukraine. Sorry, I have to say this, this is completely absurd and I'm not willing to take this as a serious question that I will address and answer seriously. What I can say is that in both crises we have played our role together with our partners. We have tried to help, we have tried to be constructive. We did this in 2008. I will recall that the first um, head of mission of the European Monitoring Mission was a German diplomat, which I think shows very well how dedicated we are to help solve this crisis. And the other is that um, when it comes to Ukraine, I think our role and the role that we try to play and how involved we are in the mixed process and everything else is so obvious that I don't need to justify this in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We have a question, Ambassador Kudav. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to criticize moderator. He took lots of our questions uh, and put uh, 
interesting questions to the panelists. My questions, uh, but we still have some other questions. So my question is uh, uh, towards uh, foreign speakers, uh, Madam Ambassador, Ambassador Emerson. On the EU side, uh, I think biggest uh, uh, challenge this year we have with you, uh, forthcoming uh, problem, for, for instance, uh, discussed in some words of foreign ministries, is uh, whether we get uh, visa facilitation, uh, uh, I mean, visa liberalization entering into force this summer, or could it be postponed because of the Ukraine uh, um, issue? Uh, of course, ideally, we would like to have both of uh, these countries uh, getting uh, uh, it uh, as soon as possible, not to cause some uh, big uh, problems for October parliamentary elections where pro-Russian forces can use this um, as an argument. So if uh, the ambassador could tell us uh, on the process itself, we know that the uh, EU Commission is very active in uh, some other countries as well, but in several capitals apparently there are doubts about it. On NATO front, you, asked, uh, you answered the questions about Warsaw Summit. We are realistic enough to, uh, not to expect big uh, grand design out of it uh, for Georgia or Ukraine. But how could you estimate probably some in medium term changing uh, security environment, uh, including in the capitals? And here, uh, hereby, I would like to kindly, with due respect to Germany, ask you not to take it as a criticism, but I mean, we definitely need more Germany in EU, more Germany in NATO. That's why we would like to have uh, uh, Ch Ch Chancellor Merkel's more active stance, as, as it was uh, vividly uh, proved, by the way, in Ukraine, where you played a major role. And we would like to have this uh, role extended to other issues, including Georgia, conflict solution here as well. So we, we don't criticize Germany. We just want you not to underestimate your power. We know that you have this power. She's, she's the most powerful woman in the world, if not um, a, a human being. So. <laughs> So do it more actively, you can do it. And if you trust, uh, have a confidence in your forces, you can do it. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So I'll start with um, uh, Mr. Emerson this time. So. On the visa question, first of all. I um, mean, the, the level of commitment now by the institutions of the European Union to doing this sometime later this year is of the highest order. And I would be extremely surprised. I mean, the formal decision by the Council of Ministers is not yet taken, but I would be extremely surprised uh, if this were derailed in any way. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to comment on what, uh, what you said about the amount of the debate uh, so far today attached to the question of full membership of NATO and full membership of the EU. Uh, and my colleague from the left said, well, don't, don't overdo this. I would, uh, I would absolutely in, endorse this, that nobody can put a timeline on either, uh, nobody in either of the two Brussels, e EU or NATO, can put any timeline on full membership of NATO or the EU for very important reasons. But, and now the but is this, in the case of the European Union, if you look at the content of the association agreement and, and the DCFTA, and if Georgia does it well and in depth and comprehensively, then, hey presto, in five years' time, you will discover that you have achieved the largest part of the prerequisites for EU uh, membership. Uh, and all sorts of things can happen in the course of five to ten years uh, politically. We cannot anticipate that. But uh, stick to <coughs> the operational business, which you have a roadmap for, and so do it. Thank you. Ambassador Kelly Thank you, Ambassador. Um, 
Just very quickly, I, can, I fully agree. I fully agree with um, what has been said. That um, take what is there, use it to the fullest possible extent, and you have the full support of all the, the NATO member states and also of the EU member states. With regard to the German role, yes, thank you. Um, of course, I'm always happy to hear that our Chancellor is appreciated, and I think she does a tremendous job in trying to keep it all together and to push forward the EU to get even more integrated, to have it prepared to answer the challenges that, that lie ahead. When you say we need more Germany, I think there is one organization that hasn't really been um, mentioned here and it, in recent years it hasn't been fully appreciated and that is the OSCE. Right now Germany has the chairmanship there and it means that we are trying to be more involved to, be, to, to, to solve conflict or to at least try to pave the way for solving conflicts that have been festering for far too long. It is all these frozen conflicts where we have mechanisms, where we have talks, where we have formats, but it seems that nothing is really going forward. We understand that it takes time, but we also think that we should try. We should try to be as decisive as we can. We are looking at possibilities now to support the Georgian efforts in this regard and to be more active in this regard. We haven't fully found out what it is that we can do in order not to hamper, in order not to, um, to make it more problematic for Georgia and for the other countries um, who are dealing with conflicts of this, this nature, but I think we will come up with something over this year. And we hope that maybe by the end of the year it looks a little bit better than it does now. We don't have any any clear answers on this is where it's going and we hope that all the crises, all the major crises will be solved by the end of this year or next year, probably not. But maybe there is some progress that is actually tangible. We work for that, so we hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Unfortunately, our time is up, but we still have two quick questions from the audience. Well, one and afterwards, uh, Ms. Kostan. Uh, thank you, Tamar Babavadze, International Black Sea University. My question uh, goes to the Foreign Minister and the State Minister. Uh, Georgia's European uh, aspirations and European perspective is closely watched and observed from our occupied regions. Uh, and they are particularly interested in how they can benefit from the goods uh, and what Georgia can offer in the future. And being a member of civic dialogue between Georgia and Abkhazians, I can say for sure that they usually raise those issues, how they can benefit from visa liberalization and Georgia's association agenda. Um, so I'm basically wondering what kind of messages, concrete messages, Pelosi can send to them. Thank you. I'll just give a very brief. Uh, I'll just give a very brief uh, answer to it, and then my colleague will continue on specifics. I think uh, that uh, main message is that what we do, uh, we do all, everything also for the people living in the occupied regions, and uh, they uh, should benefit uh, from. Uh, every good we are getting uh, from our European and uh, European integration path. We are very much motivated uh, to uh, further ensure uh, that we build confidence with each other, that we engage more uh, with them and we uh, have opportunity uh, to share uh, the benefits of uh, the development of the uh, developing processes in our country. Um, the relevant uh, institutions and ministries are working on that, but uh, this is the major uh, also issue for the discussion with our partners when we talk with the EU, uh, with our other strategic partners, that everything, every benefit what it, what, which is provided uh, to Georgia, it should be provided to every person living in the whole territory of Georgia, and uh, that, that whole territory includes occupied territories of Georgia.
I will try to briefly uh, compliment to, to what uh, my, my uh, colleague has just said. Yes, of course, the uh, benefits of this process is fully shared and we are willing to engage more. We are willing to see more engagement of the European Union in this process, uh, in uh, what is uh, probably the most important, the confidence building, uh, which uh, of course takes uh, time, uh, and takes a lot of time, and we are ready to uh, show uh, that uh, we share uh, our future with our citizens uh, on the uh, other side of the occupation line, and uh, with the very starting with the very specific uh, benefits of the, our domestic policy vis-à-vis -vis, uh, universal health care or social care or other projects, uh, with uh, continuing with the very specific uh, benefits of the uh, visa liberalization. Uh, for the holders of the biometric passport of Georgia and uh, with uh, more and more engagement uh, for the confidence building and for the state building uh, in our common future European homes. Uh, yes, question. since uh, I did not receive the answer on my question, let me just repeat it. Uh, you have called my question as absurd. Uh, it's your right, uh, but I do consider absurd and tragedy that thousands of Georgians and Ukrainians have been killed during their two aggressions against Georgia and Ukraine, and it has happened due to very extent, to high extent that uh, Georgia and Ukraine did not receive map programs back in April year 2008. So my question again: whether the German government is going to correct the mistake of the April year 2008 and invite Georgia and Ukraine into MAP during the Warsaw Summit? Or should we consider the absence on this question uh, as absence of readiness of the German government to correct this mistake? Uh, we, well, if, if you don't mind, Ambassador, otherwise we had a question here from uh, Helen Kostaria, and definitely will receive questions from her. Please. Very, very briefly, since we do not consider that we made mistakes, we do not think we need to correct anything. Thank you. Helen, please, and this is the last question yeah. for this panel. Uh, actually, I have very short comment. I know you're running out of time. Uh, unfortunately, I have to follow up on Gazprom issue, uh, not because I want to confront what you said, Foreign Minister, but because it's something that bears huge um, uh, security threats, um, uh, long-term security threat uh, to Georgia. First of all, I think you are in the best position to know that the issue of Gazprom is politicized, but it's not politicized from those who raise this question, but it's politicized from by nature, by nature how the uh, Russian government is using Gazprom against not only Georgia, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, even Belarus, and I'm not talking about the European states uh, that are widely and, and actively working to decrease their dependence uh, on this uh, giant. Now, uh, second point is that these are not technical ordinary talks that have been uh, conducted with Gazprom for years, because these talks are changing uh, terms of this uh, uh, relationship, of the uh, existing agreements. One term is transit term, which worsens our position, and second is uh, the uh, negotiations on additional um, uh, gas that Georgia is planning to fill the deficit. So these are not technical and regular talks. These are talks that worsen Georgian position. And thirdly, uh, the deficit uh, that Georgia has, which is uh, daily one cubic, around one, one and a half cubic, um, um, a million uh, just in winter could have been predicted for years uh, both economic development consumption and new installations that have been put in power could have been predicted for years and uh, it's very unfortunate that president of Azerbaijan has to come and send uh, opposite messages to what we are hearing from our energy minister that Azerbaijan has capacity to provide Georgia with uh, and fill the deficit so I think uh, you are those ministers who should uh, definitely be defending those, uh, th that those positions uh, that are under threat by these talks. Uh, 
Thank you for this uh, response, uh, and we highly appreciate and value that uh, the uh, civil society is so active uh, and uh, is uh, providing the views uh, on the possible risks and threats. Again, I will reiterate that the government also evaluates these risks and threats. It's not only the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry for European or Euro Atlantic Exploration, but the whole government uh, fully realizes the risks related with any deal uh, related to energy. Uh, and uh, uh, just I want to correct some facts which were provided by you, uh, just for clarity. It's not a long